And basically, uh, the one hand doesn't know what the other's, other is doing, and they're not really willing to help break through problems that can't be resolved by one team alone. And that's, that's, that's pretty unfortunate, but that's just the way it's set up. Uh, the last point is actually quite interesting. Terms of service are, are different from uh, group to group. And for instance, if you're a KDP publisher, you may know this. In your uh, description on your, on your book page on Amazon, you cannot use the, the uh, name or the title of another book. So for instance, if I wanted to write a book about, uh, let's say, um, you know, the mafia or something like that, I could not put Mario Puzo in the description itself. However, Amazon advertising does allow you to do that. And uh, so it can be a little confusing to try to realize, well, am I, am, is, is it okay if I do this? So you really have to stay on top of the terms of service because they really can, um, they really can change. And if you do something wrong with the wrong group, it can cause problems for you. So uh, this is something I always like to tell people who are getting started with publishing on their own. There's a lot of bad Amazon programs out there or programs that may not work for you unless you sell millions of books. And one of them is Audible. This is their, uh, their audiobook program. It's actually run pretty independently. But a couple of years ago, if you were a publisher and you had a 13 hour audiobook and someone listened to fr from beginning to end, you'd only get 75 cents. And that's excluding the cut that you're supposed to give the narrator. Another bad one that I think is KDP Select, which gets you into Kindle Unlimited. That's the book subscri ebook subscription program that Amazon runs. It locks you into Amazon. So you cannot sell your ebook on Apple or Google Play or anything like that. You get a very tiny amount of money every time someone reads a page. And also there's all kinds of scammers in KDP Select looking for ways to basically take more money. And they're using all kinds of technical scams, scams to do it. So I urge you, when you do sign up for an Amazon program, really pay attention to what it, what it actually does and what it means for the rest of your business, because it can really not pay you as much as you expect. And also it can, can, it can really limit what you can do elsewhere. Um, and you know, the low barriers to entry means lots of scams. So it's easy to get started on Amazon. They're famous for that, but that means lots of people or sharks are in there always trying to uh, find out how they can exploit it in some way. I've seen all of these things. And if you Google around, you'll see more of them. Um, Amazon has these automated systems to try to crack down on them, but you know, as usual, they're not really that well designed and sometimes innocent publishers will get snared by them. I know people that have gotten their account shut down. They haven't done anything wrong, but one of these uh, silly automated systems basically shut them down automatically and they have to fight to get it back. And sometimes it takes a long time to do that. And sometimes they're not successful at all. Um, CSR, that means a customer. <laughs> yes. Did someone say something? Okay. A CSR means a customer support representative or customer service representative. They may treat you with suspicion even if you've done nothing wrong. So you just have to be really patient and try to work through it. Find out exactly what they're looking for or what they think is wrong and then try to address it from there. Okay. So let's get going on discoverability. And um, you know, one place that I like to start is where everybody starts when they, when they use Amazon. That's in the search window. And you've probably seen something like this. You type in a term. And then below that, there'll be some other terms that show up uh, below the search window. So if, I, if, I, if you type in romance novels, you'll see terms like this. Uh, romance novels, bestsellers, 2018, romance novels for teens, uh, new romance novels, things like that. And it's the same on the app, which is on the right side. Um, interestingly, things are not quite the same. So this, this term right here, steamy romance novels, Kindle free, it only shows up on the web version. And what's going on here actually is these terms, it's not like a computer just randomly generating terms and sticking it in there for you to see. It's reflecting what real Amazon customers are searching for on Amazon. So by looking at these terms, you get an idea of what people want. And this can be valuable to you as I'm gonna show you pretty shortly. But also remember that the, the um, people who are using the web version of Amazon are different than the people who are using the app version of Amazon. That's why the terms are slightly different in terms of how they're ordered and what shows up. And if you know that your audience, for instance, they're more likely to use the app version, let's say that they're you know, under the age of 30, you should be paying more attention to the terms that are showing up in the app version rather than the web version. Here's another example. This isn't books. Uh, this is binoculars. I, I did this yesterday. And here are the terms that are showing up uh, below binoculars. And some of them, I don't even know what they mean, like Vortex or Unigroup. Um, but some of them, are it's easy to see what people are looking for. But again, this is intelligence that you can use if you're selling binoculars uh, to improve your listing in, in, in a certain way. And I'll show you how in a minute. All right. So this I did this search yesterday, romance novels. I want to draw your attention to a couple things. 
things about the results. First thing, there's more than 100,000 results for romance novels on Amazon. And there's no way Amazon can possibly show them all. Second thing, all of, all of the uh, books that are within the rectangle right there, those are all paid advertisements. So a publisher or an author is paying for those books to show up when people search for romance novels. There's only one title above the fold, so to speak, uh, the Magnolia Sisters, which is organic, meaning that Amazon uses a mathematical formula to determine uh, based on my interest or based on other factors to show uh, this books that are kind of uh, not paid for, but rather they're just more, more, I'm more likely to buy them. So it starts with the Magnolia Sisters. And then if I scroll down there, there will be more of them. But I think it's really interesting that most of the results at the very top, it's all paid for. App search, it's the same. Uh, steamy romance novels is a search term and at the very top is a paid result below it is or, uh, two organic search results and amazon has issues i mean one of them is is that there's just way too many books out there and too many products the other one is is that customers can't find things so like if you're searching for romance novels how can you possibly search through 100,000 romance novels to find the one that you like and then the third thing is amazon's always trying to, to make money so their solutions um one of them is uh, organic search. And so this is what I referred to before. It's a mathematical formula. Uh, sometimes people call it the algorithm to determine what shows up on the page when you search for something. And in the 1990s, it was pretty simple. I think if you search for romance novels, everybody searching for that would see the exact same thing. Now it's a bit different. It's actually personalized to, to your history and your age and other factors that Amazon takes into account. So it'll be a little bit different from person to person. And then the, the uh, second thing is paid search. And this showed up about five years ago. I began using it about four years ago. Uh, and more, it's showing up more and more on Amazon because more and more publishers are realizing that if they want to um, you know, uh, be seen, they have to pay for advertising. And I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in, a, in a, you know, 20 minutes or so. So what goes into the algorithms and they are secret algorithms. Amazon doesn't clearly state that because if they did, everyone would try to figure it out and reverse engineer. Um, Amazon search algorithm, but these are some of the factors that go in there. Uh, a couple things worth noting, strong pre-sales. If you have the ability to uh, offer a book for pre-sale on Amazon and send a lot of people there to that page and also get them to buy it, Amazon sees that as a positive indicator and will increase the organic search ranking for your book. The other thing that really affects things in a positive way is external traffic. So if you have a social media uh, account or you have a newsletter, you can send a lot of traffic to your Amazon page and Amazon pays attention to that. And that will also help your organic ranking. It may not be enough to help you show up at the very top of results, but it will help it a little bit in many places across Amazon. And you know, why should publishers care? And I've already hinted at that. It's because the data is really valuable. You can use these terms to help sell your books. Uh, one thing that's important about Amazon compared to Facebook or Google, which I've also used is that Amazon people have the intent to buy. So they're there to buy, they're not there to talk about stuff. They just, they want to research a product or buy it for themselves or for somebody else. And then also it's a great place to uh, test new keywords and to build your metadata. And when I say metadata, I think most of you know what this means, but I'll just explain it briefly. Metadata is all the information associated with your title. Um, and it could be things like the title and the subtitle and the description, but it also could be special keywords that you associate with the book and other uh, categories and things like that. And you know, one thing that I do when I'm creating a new book, one of the first things I do when I build my keyword list is actually to go to Amazon search and start typing in terms. And sometimes there's terms that I haven't even considered before that, that um, I can put into the keywords on, on Amazon. And this is, by the way, this is the Amazon KDP uh, interface where you have seven keywords per title, either paperback or um, ebook. You can also take the keywords that you learn on Amazon and you can plug them into other services. So this, this little window here, this is from IngramSpark. So I'll do my keyword research on Amazon and then I'll bring it into, into Ingram because I know that on Ingram or Apple or Kobo or Google, people are using similar terms to search for books. So here's a, um, a pretty sad example of a publisher who really messed up. You know, sometimes we publishers and authors, we think we, we know what people want uh, in terms of a, a book or a topic or how to market it or how to present it. And this, this, uh, this, this story here is about someone who was just like that. They thought they knew everything about what their customers wanted. And it was actually a brilliant book, you know, how to make, how to make a uh, book for people that want to learn spreadsheets, which are 
a little bit complicated and not everyone knows how to do that. And, and actually this publisher is me, this is my story. And when I first wrote this book, I published it as spreadsheets in 30 minutes. Um, it, was pretty, it was pretty good because I not only talked about um, basic spreadsheet concepts, but also using Excel and Google Sheets. And I thought this would really sell quite well on Amazon. And actually it was a total flop. Uh, when I released this book, it was, I was lucky to sell maybe five or 10 copies a month. Um, what actually ended up happening was I realized pretty quickly that people are not searching for spreadsheet books on Amazon. They're searching for books about Excel or books about Google. And indeed, what I did was I just released, I just released the book as Excel basics in 30 minutes with a, with a few minor changes to the text. I just changed the cover, got a new ISBN, the new, the new title, the new title is Excel basics in 30 minutes, the beginner's guide to Excel, Excel online and Google sheets. And that's been my number two selling book for the, for the, uh, for the past five years. It sold uh, thousands of copies for sure. And it basically all, all it took was just to really recognize what people were looking for on Amazon. It wasn't spreadsheets. So uh, here's another term that you may not have heard, uh, detail page view or detail page. And this is just another word for, for product page on Amazon. Amazon uses the term detail page. So I'm gonna use it too. And they also use the term DPV, detail page view, meaning somebody looks at your product page one time. So if I say one DPV, that's what that means. Um, if you get this right, it can make a big difference in how your book performs on Amazon. It can bring more readers, more revenue, and also better organic search ranking if you figure out how to make your product page, your detail page, uh, perform well and meet uh, pr prospective readers' expectations. And there's two numbers that sometimes come up in these discussions about performance and optimization for detail pages. One of them is the click-through rate. So if a, let's say that um, one of my books, it shows up a hundred times in search, in the search results, and two people actually click through to check it out. That's a CTR of 2%. The conversion rate is of all those people that come to the page, what percentage of them convert to buyers? So if I have a hundred people come to Excel basics in 30 minutes, the detail page, and 10 of them end up buying the book, that's a conversion rate of 10%. For click-through rates, if you can get a click-through rate of more than 0.3%, that's pretty good. If you can get a conversion rate of more than six or 7%, that's excellent. And you may be wondering, well, how can I possibly measure that? There's a few ways to do it. I think the ways that most people listening to this today will be able to do it is through Amazon advertising. They will give you the information to determine the CTR as well as the uh, conversion rate. So what goes into a, a detail page uh, view that converts well? So here's an example. This is one of the books my company publishes. It's called Crowdfunding Basics in 30 Minutes. The author's name is Michael J. Epstein. He lives in Los Angeles. He's a pretty uh, knowledgeable guy about how to use these crowdfunding platforms. And he wrote this book five years ago. And this is what the page looks, this is what the detail page looks like when people come to Amazon. So they'll come here either through organic search or maybe from social media or maybe from an advertisement. They'll come to this listing and then they'll make they'll evaluate it. So here are some of the things they'll evaluate. They'll take a look at the images. What they're looking for is something that looks professional. Um, Something that looks amateurish it will, will convert far less. And I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Second thing that's important is a title that explains things well. This is a bit different than the old style of traditional publishing and uh, traditional uh, news writing and journalism. And I used to work in magazines and newspapers. So I know that uh, you know, in the 1990s and before, kind of having clever headlines were, were fun to do and people would, people would appreciate it. In the age of the tech platforms that are dominating our lives, having keywords in the headlines are far better for performance in terms of uh, CTR and also for conversion rates. So this, the, the title for this book is Crowdfunding Basics in 30 Minutes, How to Use Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and other cloud crowdfunding platforms to support your entrepreneurial and creative dreams. It really describes what the book is about and some of the specific topics that are covered. Uh, the price, so that's important. Not only should the price be kind of, I think, competitive, but also it needs to say Amazon Prime. And the reason is, is because a lot of buyers, they will not buy something unless it says Prime. If your book is in Amazon KDP, a paperback book, it should be Prime. 
Sometimes it won't be. This year is actually quite special in that respect because of uh, this terrible pandemic that's taking place. Uh, but in generally speaking, uh, you want your book to have Prime next to it because that will help. That will convince people to buy it because they'll know they're going to get it in a few days. Um, you want to have ratings and reviews. Uh, I'd say you want to have at least 10. 20 is better. 100 is, e is even better. And hopefully they're going to be four star or above. Um, I'm going to talk about reviews in a little bit. But this, this, particular, this particular book has 19 ratings, four and a half stars. So that kind of meets expectations on a very basic level. Then it has a description. The description, you may notice, it has some text in there that is bigger than the rest of the text. And it also has some text that is bolded. So you can actually make a description that bolds the text. You can add spaces. You can make some of the text bigger. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And finally, there is an author page with a, a professional picture of the author. That's the picture he wanted, but it is a professional level picture and his name. And if you click on it, you can find out more information about it. So this detail page meets expectations. So for descriptions, I know that a lot of us spend a lot of time on this because we're writers. We like to have good prose. Um, we have a lot to say. Here are, some, here are some general do's and don'ts that I believe in as a author and a publisher and a marketer. Uh, the first one is a 10 second rule. So basically in 10 seconds, people should be able to figure out what this book is about. Don't give away the plot. I see a lot of uh, new authors doing this. It's a mistake. You want, to, you want to encourage people to find out more, but if you give it away in the description, they're, they're, they're gonna say, well, if I know that the, the hero dies in the end, you know, why, why do I wanna read this? Highlight the awards and the qualifications of the author if they're available. And for a new author, that may not be possible. Uh, but for instance, just listening to Carol's story, if she's writing a book about uh, nursing or her experience, she, could, she can say, yes, I was a nurse for this many years. And similarly, if you're like an expert on, let's say that you've been a, you're a fantasy author and you've written 20 books on that, I, I would put that in the description. When I say why your product is better and unique, I don't want you to compare it to other people's, other people's books. Uh, because first of all, that's against Amazon's terms of service, but you do want to stress what's special about it. So for instance, for my book, Excel Basics in 30 Minutes, one thing that's very special about it is I also talk about Google Sheets. No other Excel book talks about that. So that is highlighted in the subtitle and in, and in the uh, description. HTML formatting. HTML stands for hypertext markup language. It's a language that lets you do very simple formatting. If you want to, for instance, uh, on this bullet here, it says a B in brackets and then a close B. That will make HTML look bold if, if, it were, if I put that into uh, Amazon. If you wanna learn how to do it, just Google basic HTML tutorial and you can find out about it. Um, bullets and emojis help to break up text. I think Amazon is probably starting to crack down on emojis because they can be abused, but it may be possible to use some uh, in the description. Don'ts. You know, I think a lot of this goes without saying, you don't want a long paragraph. You don't want to, as I said before, don't give everything away or, or, just, or just describe the plot. Um, the last point may be a little bit controversial because you know, I know, first of all, some people, they don't have a marketing team. Either they can't afford it or they're just not sure who, who to turn to. And you know, they're the only marketer that they know, so they have to write the description. Uh, but if you, do have, if you do know somebody who's worked in advertising or marketing or, or, or who can help maybe step outside of your mindset about the baby you've just produced, this written work, and help you write a, a compelling description, that would be a really great service to, uh, to seek out, um, either among your friends or colleagues or friends of friends or something like that. Because sometimes when authors write their own descriptions, they can be a little bit too close to it, and they can't really give the slight outsider's perspective that can really help to uh, convey the information to the, to the people who are browsing on Amazon. Here's another thing you should never do with your title and your subtitle. It's called keyword stuffing. And you may have seen some books like this on Amazon, especially self-published books. It'll say something like the spectral key, cozy mystery gift for mom, free Kindle book. So these types of books, basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to game Amazon search engine because they know people will search for stuff like free Kindle book or cozy mystery or gift for mom. And they're trying to use that in their subtitle to sell the book. Certainly a subtitle can talk about what the book is about, but to do something like this, it's not only, you know, I think it's pretty irritating, but it's also against Amazon's terms of service. And they have specific guidelines that state you're not supposed to do anything like that. 
uh, don't do DIY covers. And I say that, and then I put up a DIY cover that I did myself. So the story with this is when I first got started in publishing, this is in 2012, I'd worked in media before. I'd never done any sort of uh, book project, uh, but I just wanted to try out an experiment. And I thought, all right, well, I know how to use Photoshop. So I'll just design a quick uh, cover here for my, for my first book, Dropbox in 30 Minutes. And I did it and it looks pretty terrible. It, it let me know that people actually were interested in this topic because it started selling. Uh, but what I quickly did once I got some revenue in is I, I turned around and hired a designer I knew. He was a magazine designer to, to do some mock-ups for something more professional looking. He came back with this. Whoops. He came back with this and uh, we chose the, the, uh, the one in the lower left corner there and it resulted in a 50% increase in sales by using a professional cover. So these days, yes, if you want to hire like a, a professional cover designer to do your book um, and like really do a custom job, it may cost a couple thousand dollars. Uh, it may cost maybe a few hundred dollars if you're willing to be flexible on the art that they can use. Or you can buy these pre-made cover designs, which uh, sometimes will do the trick, which are less expensive. You can probably do something like that for 50 or hundred dollars. But doing a DIY thing, don't, don't do that unless you're a professional cover designer yourself. All right, so here's an interesting mystery here. Uh, this particular screenshot is from a, a program called Amazon Seller Central. And I use this to sell the genealogy stationery that I mentioned earlier on. There's two different products, but they're actually the same product. They're just packaged in different ways. Uh, the, product, the red product on the top there has a conversion rate of 15%, meaning if 100 people come to the detail page for that product, 15% end up buying it, which is great. The one below it, it's almost the same product. It only has a conversion rate of 6%. So think about that. Why, why would that be? And here's the answer. So looking at this, um, the side by side, these are the two products I was just talking about. Which one do you think is the 6% one? Uh, raise your hand if you think it's the one on the left. Okay, I see Charlotte, a few other people. Which one if you think? Which one of which who thinks it's the one on the right? Raise your hand. That's six percent conversion rate. Okay, a couple of people think it's that. So it's actually the one on the left is the six percent conversion rate, and the one on the right is the fifteen percent conversion rate. And let's go through what makes the one on the left convert uh, at a lower rate than the one on the right. So the first thing, the very top, you'll see that there's six reviews, four stars. Um, there's only one picture it's a black and white picture. It's actually a picture of the product itself. And then there's the price and it says free shipping. The price is actually lower than the other one, but you'll notice that the price on the right side, it says prime next to it. The one on the right side, it also has 18 reviews. That's all, it's a five star average. And then also it has actually has four pictures. And one of them is, one of them shows the packaging around the picture. So these are the things that, these are the reasons why I think the one on the right converts so well. It's because it just looks better. It meets people's expectations. It looks more attractive. It's, it's a bit more expensive, but people may think that they're getting better value there. All right, so obviously reviews are super important. They can help drive sales because if, uh, if you have two books side by side by the same author and one of them has zero reviews, the other one has uh, 500 reviews and they're mostly good reviews, the one on the right is gonna be a better seller, better converter for sure. It impacts your advertising costs because if you're spending money on either Amazon advertising or some other program uh, to get people to go to your detail page, um, if the if 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 the uh, if there are not enough reviews or they're or they're, it's poorly reviewed, you're going to spend more money to uh, on getting people to the page at a lower conversion rate in order to to achieve sales. And another reason why reviews are important, um, I like looking at reviews, my own reviews, just to see. Uh, you know, what people are saying about the book, because sometimes they can identify problems that I may not even be aware of or things that can be improved. So that's, that's important to look at that. And there's lots of ways these days to get legitimate reviews. I always say you should be looking for legitimate reviews. Don't be asking, you know, your relatives to write reviews of your books. First of all, if Amazon figures it out, uh, they may either remove the reviews or actually uh, shut down your account or do something like make the book not visible in Amazon organic search, which is also pretty bad. Um, there's a couple ways to get legitimate reviews. One of them is the just putting a message in your in the front matter or the back matter of the book. And I'll show you I'll show you an example in a little bit. ARC program, that means advanced reader copy or advanced review copy. 
And you can either operate this yourself if you have like a, uh, a big newsletter list, or you can hire other people to organize it for you. And basically what you're doing is you're giving them a free copy of the book, but in return for that, uh, they're going to write a review and they're going to disclose that they got a free copy of the book in return, in return for writing the review. Uh, NetGalley is a fabulous program. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it before, but basically what it is, is it's an online website. They have tens or, or hundreds of thousands of librarians and readers and people that love books. And basically you upload a copy of your ebook to NetGalley and they'll, they'll make it available to all of, their, all of their users. And then the users will start writing reviews. Um, the reviews, you can use them on your, in the, in, in, on your book cover. You can use them on your website. Um, some of the reviews are actually cross-posted on Goodreads and Amazon. So you're getting a little bit of extra help there. And um, NetGalley or the partners that they work with, they may also give you a list of email addresses so you can follow up with them later on. And there are guidelines around that. Uh, but NetGalley, um, I know Angela Bowles, she was the keynote speaker yesterday. She's the CEO of the Independent Book Publishers Association. If you go to the IBPA website and search for NetGalley, they have a, a, a heavily discounted NetGalley program. I use it all the time. It's great. It's like maybe $200 or $300 for a three month listing on Amazon. And I can tell you for the nonfiction that I publish, when I put one of these, when I put one of my galleys up on NetGalley, I'll usually get at least 10 reviews, sometimes as many as 30 or 40 reviews in that period of time. And $200 or $300 is a small price to pay. So I urge you to check that out. If you're Excuse looking me, for professional this, reviews, yes, you can send your Is this only to. before you, you publish the book or can it be done after you publish the book? It can be done after you publish actually. So usually what I do is I wait till the book is available on Amazon, then I instantly register for NetGalley uh, to get that going. Because some of, the, some of the reviewers will start posting reviews within a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And the problem is if you, um, if, you, if you do it before the book is released, if they go to Amazon, they won't be able to leave a review. Or you have to tell them, please, po please post a review the day it releases. So I usually wait till after the book is published. And you can also do it for books that were published along, like, I don't know about how long ago, but I think within the last year or two, it's okay to do that. All it's right, a so great program. IBPA has a discount. And you, you upload it to them. What is the cost to you to pass this along? The cost for me to pass it along? I mean, the, the book is already published. You decide, okay, I want these people to review it. Yeah. Hopefully there'll be all kinds. Um, are you providing the free book from say Amazon where it's already listed or I mean, how are you getting it to them and, and what do they charge you? Yeah, so through IBPA, the IBPA NetGalley program, they have a three month listing or a six month listing. I believe the prices are $200 for a three month listing, uh, $400 for a six month listing. You're providing an EPUB or in some cases, a PDF of the book. So if you have an EPUB of the book, you just upload that to, Net, to uh, IBPA. They pass it along to NetGalley, along with some other information about the book, and then it gets launched on NetGalley. One thing I wanna stress about this is you're not, pay, you're not paying for five-star reviews. You're paying for reviews. The reviews may be good, the reviews may be bad. But if you're producing a professional quality book, and I believe most of us on this call, we really wanna strive for that, you'll have a better chance of getting uh, generally good reviews. And usually I get generally good reviews. I do get some bad reviews. I'm not happy about it, but actually I see that as an opportunity to learn from the reviewers. Okay, thank you. So the next type of review is actually going to professional reviewer. And if you want, you can send in your book to New York Times Review of Books or Publishers Weekly or, or uh, Ford Reviews, just their regular um, so-called, I don't know what, if they call it a slush pile or not, the chance of actually getting reviewed like that are slim, low single digits because they get hundreds or thousands of books per month to review and they, and they can't possibly do them all. So what I do recommend is taking advantage of these special programs set up by Kirkus Indy, uh, Ford Reviews. There's a couple other ones. I think Publishers Weekly does a program too. It's a paid program. You're paying them money. It's usually 300 or $400. They're assigning one of their reviewers to, to read the book and review it. Professional quality review, 
no guarantee it'll be good or bad. Uh, yeah. I've done this with Kirkus Indy maybe about six or seven times. I've gotten one two-star review and the rest are usually four or five. So there's no yeah. guarantee. Also, you can decide how you want to use the text for that. You can put it on your Amazon listing. There's a place uh, on Amazon where you can, or on your, uh, not Amazon, the um, Amazon Author Central, where you can actually put professional reviews or you know professional level reviews, and you can paste them in there and cite the source. So you can stick them in there, and it shows up on your Amazon description. So that's a good pro. I think that's a worthwhile program too. Um, early reviewer program. This is available to people who are professional sellers on Amazon using Amazon Seller Central. Um, I don't recommend this as for most people that are just publishers. It's useful for me because I, I, I sell other types of things on Amazon. But basically the way it works is I pay them $60 and Amazon identifies people to solicit reviews from, to post on Amazon. Again, no control over what those reviews will look like. They may be good. They may be bad. Um, there, there's a program called Goodreads Giveaway. I think it might, I think it's called Goodreads First Reads or something like that now. now. And the idea is very similar to NetGalley. You're providing, uh, basically, you're paying them money. They're, they're sending, they're, they're making the book available to a list of their um, fans or their readers. And then the people, they may review it. They don't have to, they may do it. Um, and you have to either send them a physical copy or maybe you can upload an ebook copy. I used to use that five or six years ago, and I stopped using it after I, I was just not getting any results from it, but it's, it, may be, it may be an option for you. And then finally, one other thing you can do is you can, you can actually stick something, I mentioned this earlier, actually, the, the book front matter, the back matter. Some people, if you buy stuff on Amazon, they actually put like a little card inside the box and asking you to leave a review. Um, so, yeah, here's an example of asking for a review in the back matter. So, at the end of all of my books, I have a message from the author. Uh, this is from PowerPoint Basics in 30 Minutes. And it says, P.S. If you're happy with the knowledge you've gained from PowerPoint Basics in 30 Minutes, please let other people know about the book, either by leaving an honest review online or recommending this guide to your personal professional networks. It's okay for you to ask for an honest review. There's no problem with that. And I do it every time. I don't know how effective it is, but I think probably of the thousands of books that I've sold uh, in 30 minutes guides, some of the some of these messages have convinced people to to leave a review on Amazon and elsewhere. Yes. Ian, um, do you know anything about a place called Reader's Favorites? I don't know about that particular site. That, it, it's a it's a rather large review site where you uh, upload a book and you can get a free review or or you can uh, pay money uh, for guaranteed reviews. Um, and it's sort of an auction, I believe. Uh, they've got a lot of readers, and I don't know who they are, but it's right. called Readers Favorite, I think, dot com. Does the does the guarantee say anything about the quality of the reviews? Um, what it says is that I remember is that they'll give you stars anywhere up to five stars, and they if it if it gets less than four stars, they're not going to. Uh, put it out on their site. Yeah, so, so what you've just described is actually against Amazon's terms of service. And I'd be very careful of using any service like that. Any service where they're promising to give you at least a four-star review or five-star review, it's against Amazon's terms and, and don't do it. No, they're not promising. They just say, if, you, if the reviewer gives it less than four stars, they're not gonna post it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's against Amazon's terms. I wouldn't do it. It's also paid, which is, you know, I think you're supposed to give a disclosure and you can't, you can't influence the, uh, the quality of the review in any way. So it's against Amazon's terms. I wouldn't do it. Ian, we had a question from in the chat. Sure. What was the question? I can't see the, I can't see it because I'm. What about the Read Z Discovery Program? That question? Yeah, I don't know about that particular program either. Keep going, Ian. Yeah. So, um, so here's a review you never want to see. It says uh, the, the one on the bottom: "Don't buy. One star. For some reason, the paperback version is actually printed backwards. It says extremely hard to read. Don't buy this version." So, after seeing that, what would you do? And, and please, anyone, speak out. What, what would your what would be your first suggestion after seeing a review like that on one of your own books? I'd sue Amazon. Okay, I don't think suing is possible, but that's an interesting one. Anybody else? 
the report from Amazon. Yeah, so it, you can you can report abuse if you think it is abuse. But let's let's say that let's say that there's some hint of truth in here. You think that maybe there's maybe they could be right about it. it. It seems like it's not someone playing a prank. I would I would say something like, "Oh golly, I didn't realize that this happened with one of my uh, print editions. I will get right to the book printer I use to correct this." Something like yes. that. Yeah. So actually related to that, I I would order a copy of the book and <laughs> actually see, first of all, if it's true. And if it is true, get to the printer right away or tell if you if you're using a program like Amazon Advantage or Amazon Seller Central, get the books back. There's some huge technical problem and you do not want any more books going out because if that's true for all of the readers who are looking at this, you're gonna get a lot of one-star reviews and a lot of confused people. So um, sometimes it's a, it's a, seeing something like this is a reason to investigate further. And I urge you to check that out if that, should that happen to you. And you know, the, one other thing about this page, the review above it, the person, they said they never received it, but they still gave it three stars. And, and I consider that to be a good outcome actually. Uh, by the way, if somebody does leave a review and they say they didn't receive it or there is a problem with shipping, you can contact Amazon about that. And sometimes Amazon, if, it, if it's relatively recently, they may take it down because that's Amazon's responsibility to deliver it to the, to the user. And that, shouldn't reflect, that should not reflect on the quality of the book. So be on, be, a, be on the lookout for things like that. Okay, let's move on a little bit to Amazon advertising. Uh, so this is gonna be a, a bit high level. I'm not gonna go through the step-by-step -step of doing an Amazon advertising, except for the very first, the beginning stage of it. And you know, I showed you before some screenshots of um, organic and paid advertising showing up on search results for um, romance novel. Here's an example of searching for genealogy in books and uh, the top two results are paid and I paid for those. Those are my advertisements. They showed up at the very top. And it's a good thing too, because there's thousands of books related to genealogy and my book showed up at the top. And I know some people have issues with this and they're thinking, well, that's not really fair to everybody else that's in, in, the, uh, you know, that's in the queue there. Um, I would say this, first of all, usually when you go shopping, even in a retailer or a supermarket, you'll see things that are given extra special promotion. And it's not just because the supermarket manager is feeling generous out, out of the goodness of their heart and they wanna put you know, this thing at the end of the aisle. The distributors or the manufacturers are actually paying for that. And this is similar to what we're doing here. We're paying extra money so our books get uh, more visibility on the system. By the way, we are competing with other people who are doing the same thing. It shows up in many places. Here's a listing for one of the books that I published, Genealogy Basics in 30 Minutes by Shannon Coombs Bennett, a award winning book. And uh oh, there's someone else's advertisement right below the description. Amazon puts that there. I have no choice in the matter. Somebody paid for that to show up there. And then I think you've probably seen these carousels on the detail pages of Amazon. Uh, sometimes it will say like books that are also related to Excel basics in 30 minutes. Those are organic results, but then it will say, you'll see a carousel like this. It says sponsored products related to this item. All of these are paid. I have arrows next to some of them because the people that the uh, publishers that did that, they opted to include a description or a little bit of marketing copy to add below the advertisement. Other ones didn't, including PowerPoint Basics in 30 Minutes. That's one of my books. Uh, when I made that advertisement, I don't remember why, but I didn't. I did not choose to have custom copies show up, and it doesn't show up. Uh, here's another example: genealogy gifts on the Amazon app. Um, the first result there is sponsored by Easy Genie. That's one of my brands, so that showed up at the very top, and then. Uh, on another product, you can see sponsored products related to this item. And again, one of my books is, uh, is, is, uh, is showing up there as are other, other publishers books. Okay, so what is Amazon advertising? It's a self-serve CPC program and um, CPC means cost per click. Sometimes when you talk with marketing people, they'll, uh, especially online marketing people, they'll say CPC or CPM. Uh, CPM means cost per, per 1,000 views. Uh, M is 1,000 in Roman numerals. So uh, magazines also do that in newspapers. They'll say something like, all right, well, we have a circulation of 40,000 per day. 
and the uh, CPM per day is going to be, you know, three hundred dollars or something like that. Uh, at, at the Techn technology platforms like Amazon or Facebook or Google, sometimes they use CPM, but more often these days they use CPC. That is, every time someone clicks on the ad, you, the advertiser, you're paying money for it, even if nobody buys the book. So keep that in mind. Different ways to access it. I think many of you will probably access it through KDP. A few of you may use something like Amazon Advantage or Amazon Vendor Central or Seller Central. And they'll show up on the website or on the app and maybe other places too, because I think Amazon's trying to expand their network. So if you go to KDP, here's how to get started. Go to your book list. So this is my KDP account for my paperback books. And you'll see these buttons next to each of the titles, promote and advertise. Click on that. You'll come to this screen. Do not click the button that says enroll in KDP Select. KDP Select is not a good program for you. What they're doing is, if you sign up for that, first of all, you have to withdraw your book from any other marketplace where it appears, such as Apple or Kobo or Google Play, and you'll get access to some of uh, Amazon's marketing programs, which are great, but you'll only be, the book will only appear in Kindle Unlimited and you will not get paid mo money every time someone buys a digital download. You'll get paid a few pennies every time someone might read a page. I do not recommend KDB Select. Instead, on the right side of the page, it says run an ad campaign. There's a drop down menu there. It says choose a marketplace. And basically you'll choose amazon.com. That's the US marketplace. You can also advertise in other countries if you think that's helpful for you. And then you'll get, then you'll get taken to the Amazon advertising uh, interface. So why use it? I've already said you go to the head of the line. Um, you're targeting people who have intent to buy. That's different than Facebook or Google. Um, you can do it yourself. I think it's possible for anybody watching this to create a very simple Amazon advertising campaign uh, using the KDP steps I just outlined a little while ago. If you're confused about that, when you get started or the Amazon advertising interface doesn't make sense, I have a bunch of free videos on YouTube which show exactly how to create an advertisement. And I'm gonna show you a link to uh, access those later on. Or you can just go to, to YouTube and Google how to make an Amazon advertisement. And you hopefully you'll get uh, some, some resources you can use. Very important, you can measure the results of the campaigns. So a lot of the time with, Amaz with uh, advertising, traditional advertising, like a magazine or something like that, you don't really know how effective a campaign is unless you're asking the, uh, the buyer to use like a special code or something like that. Um, but Amazon advertising and some of the other technology platforms, they actually give you a lot of data that shows you how the ad is performing. And then you can use that data to evaluate, first of all, do I wanna continue this campaign or do I wanna shut it down? Or is there something else I can do to make it better? Um, there's, you can spend a lot of money on this, but you can also start with just a little bit of money. So let's say that you're a new author, you only have one book out there. If you want to, you can spend $10 a day on this or less, $5 a day, just to get some, some easy traffic or just to see how it performs at all. Um, I say it's still possible to get some bargains, but that's changing. And the reason why is because lots of authors and publishers are figuring out how to use Amazon advertising. And as more people use the platform, that makes the bids for keywords more expensive. So for instance, I just showed you earlier on uh, a, a, a search results for um, romance novel. I'm pretty sure you can bet that there's probably thousands of authors and publishers using romance novel as a keyword that they're paying money for people to click on to go to their detail page. And if you have thousands of people bidding on that, that means you have to bid more money to be the winner of the uh, automated auctions that Amazon has to do that. And over time, the popular keywords will get more and more expensive. It'll be very hard to, to even have your advertisement seen with them. So what indie, indie authors and publishers like us have to do is we really have to pay attention to the uh, more obscure keywords or the more obscure niches that people might be searching in. You can do, in, if you're really into this stuff, sometimes I am, if I have the time, I'll do like split testing or so-called A-B testing. So I'll be advertising Excel basics in 30 minutes and I'll have uh, two campaigns going at once. One campaign will use one type of text to describe it, like marketing copy, and another campaign will use another mar marketing message. And then I'll compare them and see which one works and which one doesn't, and I'll shut off the one that doesn't. So I'm only spending on money on the more successful one. This is hugely important. Anybody who wants to use Amazon advertising, do this, because Amazon doesn't let you put the keywords or the... Uh, 
the names of authors or pub or uh, other 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 people's uh, titles in their descriptions on their on their detail pages. But Amazon advertising, you can do this. So let's say that you're publishing mystery novels in your Amazon advertising campaign. What who are the authors you want to have as a in the in the uh, in the keyword bidding? Stephen King, Tabitha King, anybody who's written a horror novel. For for crime for crime novels, actually, Carol, I bet that a lot of people are using, uh, you know, Mario's name, or The Godfather, and it's okay to do that with Amazon advertising. By the way, just as you can do it with them, they can do it with you too. Um, I always bring this up because sometimes it's it's easy to spend a lot of money on advertising, but actually you're actually losing money on it, even if it looks like the campaign is successful. So when I say know your margins before you launch a campaign, you should have a general idea. Like if you sell one book on Amazon, how much money you're going to get back? And, and if you're using Amazon KDP, that's usually pretty easy. For an ebook, you should be getting about between 60% and 70% of the cover price of the book. Uh, and it's, it's, it'll, be a bit, it'll be a little bit less if you have lots of images in the book. Okay? Or maybe, you have, maybe it's actually you're working with another author, so you have to pay a royalty or there's something else going on. Um, but for me, for my books, I know that my margins on Amazon, whether it's an ebook or a paperback book, it's usually about $4.50 or $5. So on a campaign, if I'm spending more than, say, $4 uh, to, to get a single sale, it's probably not worth it for me. And actually, I, usually I, I won't even do it if it's, if it's less, you know, if it's more than $2 or something like that. And you can calculate those costs in Amazon, Amazon advertising. Focus on these things, uh, CTR and conversion rate, spend per sale and profit. Those four numbers, those are the most important numbers that you can find from Amazon advertising. CTR is a click through rate. So if you have a click, if, you, if barely anybody are clicking on the advertisement, you can just shut it off because it's, it's not gonna, it's, first of all, it's, it's not sending people to your page and of the people who are going to your page, maybe they're not really converting that well anyways. Uh, spend per sale means how much you're spending for each sale on Amazon. And as I told you, I, if it's more than $2 per each sale, it's not worth it to me. And I may shut off that keyword. And then of course, at the end of the day, you know, what's the profit on all these sales you're getting through Amazon advertising? Amazon has lots of extra met metrics in there and they'll, they'll show them to you and they'll, they'll, as if they're great numbers for you to pay attention to. One of them is called ACOS. Another one is called ROAS. Uh, ACOS means advertising cost of sales. ROAS means return on advertising spend. Um, these numbers, sometimes professional marketers like to use them. I think they're a bit misleading actually to most, most of us because they don't take into account the cost of producing your book. So that's why I say you really have to know your own margins before you get involved in advertising. Um, your detail page needs to look great. Remember all those things I showed you with, with uh, crowdfunding basics in 30 minutes? So if you, if you have the best advertising campaign in the world, it has like a, a click-through rate of 10%. All these people are coming to your detail page, but your detail page doesn't look good. And people aren't going to be, that means your conversion rate will be low. And you're basically throwing away a lot of money on clicks that aren't translating into people who are buying your book. So, you know, a great, a great ad with a high, this is what I just said. Great ad with a high CTR and uh, lots of detailed page views with low conversion rate means wasted money. Um, I said this before, you can compete against other publishers, but they can compete against you. Um, ads are not fire and forget. Usually I like, to, I like to tend the garden every couple of weeks. I'll take a look at the keywords that are performing well, uh, the ones that aren't performing well. Maybe I might raise the bid or lower the bid on some of them. And this is a very high level view of how Amazon advertising works. You, advertise, you access it through Amazon KDP, like I showed you earlier. Um, you select the advertising type. For most of you, it should be a type of ad called a sponsored product ad. You choose the book you wanna advertise. Um, you select how the ads are targeted. That's beyond the scope of this video. And if you're, if you're having trouble figuring out the keywords, the first thing you can do, just go to amazon.com and search for some keywords related to your book and see what turns up. That, that, I do that all the time. There's another tool I mentioned there called uh, Uber Suggest. That's a free online tool. And they'll, you can basically type in a term and it will show you a list of related terms. So you can try that too. Um, you can use a, an additional asset like a tagline or a marketing copy. You enter your bids and budget. You enter the timing details. Be careful. Don't, don't, set it, don't set up your advertising campaign to run forever. 
for no end date because you may forget about it and your ad campaign still running, spending money and you're losing money. So set, set an end date and you can change the end date later if you want to extend it. Budget, by the way, there's a couple budgets. One is your kind of what you're paying for each click. So the, your, your uh, maximum bid. And then there's how much you'll, maximum you'll pay every day. So usually for most campaigns, I'll do 10 or, 10 or $20 a day for a campaign. So uh, a lot of people ask me like, what about Facebook ads? And actually I heard David yesterday mention at the, mention at the beginning, they were using Facebook ads to drive traffic to the uh, conference. And actually Facebook ads, they can be effective. I do use them. Uh, here's, a, here's an ad for one of my, one of the products that I sell. This goes, by the way, this doesn't go to Amazon. This goes directly to my website, easygenie.org, if you click on that. Um, unfortunately, Facebook advertisements, they're very expensive to learn. They're hard to learn. And you usually, end, you usually spend a lot of money making a lot of mistakes before things start to work out. Um, I've spent this year probably about thirty or forty thousand dollars on Facebook ads, and maybe I think the profit has been about ten or fifteen. And it's been a lot of work and a lot of things that went wrong. Actually, the election that just finished up that had a negative impact on Facebook campaigns, not just for me but for lots of other people, because Facebook was so paranoid about people ma manipulating the platform, they started automatically shutting down uh, business accounts for small businesses like mine because there was some behavior that they thought was uh, indicated that some sort of fraud or manipulation was taking place. So actually I stopped using Facebook advertisements for the past uh, two or three weeks or so. So just be aware of that. If you do wanna learn how to use Facebook advertisements, what I did was I, uh, in April of this year, one weekend, I just found a, a good YouTube channel that talked about how to do it. And I sat down the whole weekend and figured it out. That that's the only way to do it. There's no easy steps. It'll take hours to do it. And you'll probably have to try things, fail at it, try again before you can get it to work. It's not as e Amazon advertising is far easier than, than uh, Facebook advertising. All right, uh, I think my session's almost over here. Maybe I have time for one or two questions. Is that okay, Eddie? Uh, you can go over if you want. We, we got nothing for another half hour, so. Oh, okay. Well, go ahead, take questions. Yeah, questions, anybody? Um, I actually have one. Okay. Uh, you you mentioned earlier about KDP Select. Mm -hmm. Would you? I know that you're kind of anti that, but would you ever look at that as just trying to get exposure, a way of getting exposure for your for your authors? No, because if I want exposure, I'm actually gonna. I'd rather use um, Amazon uh, Amazon advertising. I think it's a much better way to get exposure and people will pay the full price for the book. And by the way, you know, if people don't like the book, they can return it, including eBooks. I think you have a seven day window to return it, but I don't like the idea that um, people are paying a subscription and I'll just get a few pennies every time someone opens the book. It, that, that doesn't work for me. I, I see the books that I'm producing as premium products and KDP select. I really think it devalues the book. I also really don't like the way that KDP Select demands you withdraw your ebook from other marketplaces. I like being available in, in, in Apple, in Kobo, in Google, in these other uh, other ebook services. So, so that, that's what I think about it. Okay. Well, I think that's somebody has to make a choice whether they want to be exclusively on Amazon or be seen on, on other platforms. It's sort of like uh, when, when you put the book up, if it's what is it? Uh, I can't remember if it's distributed or what is it called. Um, Ian, you probably know right off the top of your head. But when you say you want it to be available on other platforms besides besides Amazon, but what I wanted to mention about advertising is you can lose your shirt on advertising on any of these platforms. These are generally yeah. speaking, they're very complicated. And I know somebody who does a lot of Amazon advertising. He told me the other day he spent probably ten thousand dollars, and he and he sold a lot of books, but he lost money because he didn't price his book very well. Yes, literally, yes. he underpriced his book. That, and that's actually that's actually a really good point. Um, he's complaining I, about losing money. Yeah. So uh, earlier on, I showed you some of the products my company sells, and one of them is called a cheat sheet. And when I first released this cheat sheet, it's basically like a cardboard four-page. Um, list of examples and keyboard shortcuts for software. 
And when I first released them, I priced them at four ninety nine because everybody else was pricing them around that price. And I thought to be competitive, I had to be in that range. I quickly learned I was losing money on it. This is even before Amazon advertising. So my margins were, were so thin and not enough people were ordering them. I'd be killed on the shipping costs. And I, and I basically threw a Hail Mary. I said, screw this. If I can't, if, I'm just gonna start charging 6.99 or 7.99. And if people don't want it, all right, what the heck? Cause otherwise I can't keep on going. And you know what happened? People kept on buying it because they really wanted that. And oftentimes it, they weren't even the ones paying for it. It was their school district or their office that's paying for it. So they weren't as price sensitive to that particular type of product. But I agree, it's possible to really lose your shirt on this stuff. You really need to understand the pricing and it's okay to make mistakes with pricing, but also recognize when you're making the mistakes and then adjust accordingly if you have something that's successful. Yeah, just one thing about Facebook. I, um, a friend of mine, she is in the declutter space. And right now she's spending around $5,000 a day on Facebook advertising and making pay off. And her, pre, her product only costs $29 a month. It's a subscription to, to declutter. Wow. And if you know what you're doing, you can really do very well. But the vast majority of people who get into this really don't know what they're doing. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good point. So it is, pot, I, I've heard of stories like this, people spending five or $10,000 a day or something on Facebook advertising and able to profit from it. Um, unfortunately, one thing about Facebook, which is I think even worse than Amazon, uh, Facebook, they don't really wanna pay attention to you even if you're spending at that level. I mean, they're really, because basically if people are always calling them up and you know, saying, hey, you shut my account down for some reason and it's not, they're not spending enough, Facebook doesn't consider it worth their while. So they really pay more attention to their biggest customers and the little people, they don't pay attention so much to it. Um, Amazon has another problem, and that's in general, they're trying to automate all their customer support. And I've seen, maybe you've discovered this yourself when you contact Amazon about some problem related to your book, and the response you get, it doesn't make any sense. It's like they're answering a different question. And the reason why is because a human being never saw that. They just looked at some keywords in your question, and yeah. they used their artificial intelligence to answer it, and it's just the wrong answer. So yeah. um, it's just something to be aware of. Ian, yeah, I, mean, I had a, just wanted to remind people about something. I'm sorry. Who had a question? Ian, there's a, there's a uh, question in the chat. Someone's asking about book bud, book bud ads. I'm, I'm guessing they want your opinion on that. Yeah, so I looked at, I looked at book, I think it's called book bub. Yep. Um, I think it's this, if that's the same one. It uh, actually applied and they rejected me. <laughs> so I never used that. I don't know why. Um, I've heard good, th I've heard people that get into that. It's like a news, it used to be a newsletter product. I don't even know what it's like right now. I've heard it can be pretty effective, uh, but that was two or three years ago. I'm not sure of the story right now. Okay. I, I have a question, Nan. Sure. Um, uh, my name's Pam. I'm on Vendor Central for the last 20 years. Wow. And um, I, well, I, one of the books that I have been on there 20 years and it's done very well. It's been taken down because I've got a new edition. I, um, they now have a new way to enter my book into a catalog there, which I haven't done yet, but I have some good reviews from the first edition. Um, will that be something that I manually have to pull over? Uh, can I use some of the reviews from the first edition um, as, as well as hopefully get the new ones in? So it's my understanding that Amazon will let you carry over reviews from earlier editions as long as the title and the subtitle are the same. They are. If there's anything that, yeah, you're, you should be good. I'm saying should be because Amazon is, sometimes I've discovered little quirks about certain programs, they don't let you do things. Um, one other thing about Vendor Central, you're actually very fortunate to still be on it because I, it's my understanding that they've actually pushed pushed a lot of um, authors and publishers off of that platform recently. Well, it, it was called small print something or other. And then every, and I used to have my own personal Amazon rep in Seattle. Wow. And then, you know, it was more and more automated and more and more yep. automated. But I still can get a real person when I do um, do a case in there um, and in, in log if I've got an issue. Yeah, but Luck, sometimes lucky you. They, they can't solve me. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Vendor Central. I get orders every Monday night, except <laughs> I will tell you that during the pandemic, everything shut down for me from April and May for about eight weeks because yep. they were delivering 
as we said earlier, toilet paper and yeah, they were prioritizing <laughs> other stuff. Ian, Ian, there's another question. There's another question in the chat. I don't. Are you, can you see the chat, Ian? Uh, I think I have to stop sharing. Oh, okay, that's right. You, I'll, I'll read it to you. Okay. It says, Ian, do you offer that service for others? So I, I'm, I'm assuming that she wants to know if you offer to help out. People. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't do consulting anymore for, um, for Amazon or any other services. And actually, one reason is, is because. It's, it can be very frustrating dealing with Amazon sometimes. And uh, as I just mentioned to Pam, sometimes there's little quirks in the system where you think something should work the way you expect it to, and it doesn't. And it's, uh, first of all, it costs money to hire consultants, but also when you know, you're not getting any results, it's, it's not a, gr a good feeling for either the consultant or the, or the client. So I'm sorry, I don't do that. However, I do wanna say that a lot of the things I talk about, including not just the high level strategic stuff, but also the tactical stuff, like how to create an advertisement, if you go to leanmedia.org on the screen there, uh, click on video and you can go to my YouTube channel and I have dozens of videos about this stuff and uh, explaining step-by-step -step how to do things. I hope that helps. Now, Ian, uh, what do you say to people like me who think that Amazon is an evil giant? And They're an done, evil giant. And they've done more to wreck book, book publishing than they have to support it. Yep, I agree with you 100%. And what I tell people is, um, you know, Amazon's not going to go away, although there may be some, you know, some uh, antitrust action at some undetermined point in the future. What you should do is see Amazon not at being at being at the mercy of Amazon, but rather learning from Amazon, taking those learning experiences and applying them to your own website. So my focus right now is not on building my Amazon sales, but actually building sales on my own websites using other methods, other platforms like building a really good new newsletter list, those types of things. And I encourage everybody else to see, it, see Amazon the same way. Test your products out there, test keywords, test ideas, see what people are searching for, see what people are saying about your competitors' products, use those learning experiences and bring them right back to your own website. Ray, well, thanks. Ray, I might say Amazon has ruined book publishing as we knew it, but I can name 50 good things about Amazon. One is that Kindle, you can literally upload your book to Kindle for free. So any, any person, and I wouldn't say idiot, but I mean, there's too much junk out there, but people can get published for no money at all. And then they can get seen by readers. So they can have a global audience without, without having to really spend a dime. And the other thing is, you know, when you can download uh, sample chapters of books or, you know, samples of books for free, you can get exposure to knowledge uh, all over the world for, for zero cost. And that is something that was literally impossible just a decade or so ago, even a few years. I mean, these things change by the minute. So I wouldn't say they're all evil. I mean, they're, they're ruining bookstores, yes, but they're also opening up other ave avenues. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'd, I'd feel more like you, David, if if the, 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 the billions that Amazon makes, and I, I have to underscore, most of that money comes from people who don't know what they're doing, but the billions that Amazon makes, if they had some way of distributing that more to uh, other book sources like bookstores and uh, publishers and writers, so on, but the, some, uh, some other way of, of being more uh, socially responsible with the uh, profits that they make. Hey, Ray, can I say something to you that when I was traditionally published, they started off giving me, as I told you, for the nurse's story, like $6,500. Once uh, Amazon, once uh, Bantam bought it for 82,000 or whatever, and then book clubs bought it and everything like that. Simon & Schuster still decided they had to make a 15% profit on the hardcover. And what they did is they cut down my profit from 15% my royalty to um, 12%. Otherwise they wouldn't reprint it. So I think that acknowledging that Amazon is a bully, yeah. But then you gotta acknowledge that publishing like Hollywood are some of the biggest bullies going and independence is the way to sort of get out of the way of it. I mean, you have to take a lot more responsibility and have a lot more knowledge, but 
with a lot of the ability to outsource now and stuff like that, you have a more layer, you know, you have a more level playing field. It's just a lot more work, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. as far as the uh, advertising, when I did the Simon & Schuster stuff and Bantam stuff, it was three weeks of three separate tours of getting up at five o'clock in the morning getting to sleep at 12 o'clock at night in the next city and doing that morning after morning after morning for three weeks. And if the books weren't in the bookstores, you still missed your opportunity. You didn't get a nickel for that, even though they paid the expenses, they didn't pay you for any of that. And yet if they couldn't make 15% generally across the board, they pulled the author's uh, royalty down, you know? Ian, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, can authors that are being published by someone else like myself, can they do advertising through Author Central? So Author Central doesn't, doesn't have um, any, any links to Amazon advertising. It has to be through a KDP, Amazon Advantage, Amazon Vendor Central, or uh, Amazon Seller Central. Do you feel that they at some point might see that as a way of increasing sales for themselves? I'm not sure actually, because I think one thing Amazon might be concerned about is dealing with more than one partner about the same book and mm -hmm. conflicts arising because of that. Yeah, I think okay. you need access to the account of where the book is sort of housed. Yeah. No, they don't. They don't? Oh, okay. No, they, 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 have, they have access to their page and what they can do. I was just wondering if at some point you might think that a Amazon would would make that option available to them, but okay. Yeah, I mean, the sad reality is, is a lot of publishing companies, they don't know how to use Amazon advertising. So that's not even an option or, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very selective in what they promote. And you may, you as an author may ask your publishing company, hey, you know, why aren't, you, why aren't you spending more money on a campaign? And they may say, well, you know, the sales of your book so far doesn't really justify that. Mm -hmm. um, it, get, it gets tricky. And I, I think actually for people in the future, if you, if you do sign with a traditional publisher, talk about stuff like this because you want to be able to figure it out and want to make sure that your, your book gets the visibility it deserves. Eddie? Yes. Can I plug Ian's... Yes, please do. Presence please do. On our, just before you go, Ian, um, thank you for coming on the podcast next week. Oh, you're face, welcome. Yeah, the Facebook TV. It's going to be on Amazon and to some extent Facebook advertising. So people will get a chance to ask more questions. And I put the links in the chat. Yeah, so some of this stuff will be similar to what you've heard today, but I'll, I'll mix it up a little bit and maybe talk yeah. a little bit more about Facebook advertising in particular, because I think there is some interest there, too. Yeah, I think it's kind of an inexhaustible <laughs> topic. Yeah, well, you know, at, at IBPA, I gave an Amazon deep dive uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. and it lasted all day. I was, up, <laughs> I was up on stage, just there's just so much to talk about. And, yeah, uh, we got half an hour, but, but if people this. can leave questions in advance, then we'll kind of know what's on your mind. Um, you can go to those links and just put them in the YouTube comments. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to answer questions at that okay. event as well. Okay, thanks. Let me just say something about BookBub. They're, they're, lo they're located in Cambridge and I went to their office to see if somebody would speak here at the conference and they said no. But BookBub is the kind of thing where you definitely have to apply. I heard that they take less than 10% of the people who apply. They send out emails two or three times a week. They heavily discount your book to get readers, but people who, who are successful on it say it's very, very good for them. So there's a way, it's sort of like way oversubscribed in terms of the number of people who want to get in, but you do have to pay. I think the minimum is $700 to get in. Um, and they only take 10%, wow. something like that. But, but you can get tremendous exposure because, I mean, having a list, and we haven't really talked about that here, but Alinka talked about it earlier. If you have a list of people you can reach, that is very, very valuable because, you know, you could be running ads all over the place and, and people aren't seeing it. You could be doing social media. But if you have a list that goes to people who are reading your emails, you can talk to them. But that's what book, BookBub's success is based on its list. 
those people are book readers. Yeah, so no, that's that, that's that's what that's what I that's what I've heard too, um, and that's probably why I got rejected. They, I was one of the ninety percent that they didn't consider as being uh, worthy. I, I, you know, my feelings aren't hurt by that. I have other things that I can do, <laughs> but that may be an option for uh, some people. I, I've heard that fiction is actually a better seller on BookBub yeah, than definitely, um, definitely, not, yeah, definitely fiction and things like that. Right. Um, All right. Any other questions? Before, we, before I sign off. Okay. Well, thank well, you so thank much you, for Lee. coming to the presentation today. Thanks. I hope to see some of you uh, at the um, at the, uh, the the event that Charlotte and Eddie are going to organizing later on this week. Thank you for for being here, Ian. You're welcome. Glad to, glad Thanks to participate. So much, hope to see everybody at the at next year's event in person. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye-bye.